morning and welcome to Resurrection Sunday. I love that. Resurrection Sunday. I'm glad you're here. Today I'm going to be retelling the story of that first Easter. Now, I'm going to mix in some of the cultural history from the first century Roman Empire that you may not be aware of unless you took Roman history as a college course. I, I believe understanding the culture that our Jesus stories grew in and out of adds some real meaning to our understanding of what happened. So we'll mix in some of that today as we retell the story of the resurrection of Jesus. I'm really excited that you're here with us today. This morning is found in the Gospel of Mark. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome 
brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He, was, he has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The words of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Friday. The world looked bleak indeed. Many had believed Jesus to be their Messiah. They had hope for their people. True, they were not quite sure what a Messiah's exact role in society should be, but they believed him to be from God, and their belief in God made that a good thing. But Friday, the Roman government had executed Jesus as an enemy of the state. Execution by crucifixion was reserved solely for enemies of Rome who could cause a serious threat to the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, which was not really peace at all. Roman peace was won by military victory and at best was merely a lull between episodes of violence. And Friday, they executed Jesus. Most of the disciples and followers of Jesus hid for fear of their lives. They couldn't be sure that the Roman government wasn't also looking for the followers of Jesus to crucify. You see, the standard practice for the government was to execute the followers of some enemies of Roman peace. Some enemies, but not all enemies. The subsequent roundup typically depended upon what kind of resurrection Rome deemed the movement at large to be. If the movement utilized violence to combat Roman peace, the movement was violently crushed by crucifying leaders and followers, including women and children. If the movement was a nonviolent protest, the leader was crucified and the followers were typically left to live in fear. Now, this technique worked quite well for the Roman Empire. Followers of nonviolent rebellion saw their leader or leaders violently and cruelly executed by crucifixion. And they lived to vocally discourage others from trying to rebel against such formable foes. Thus, followers of nonviolent movements of insurrection were left to live in their fear. This technique worked quite well, usually. Usually. Mark told us that some of the women had watched as Jesus was crucified, knowing that Rome could have them arrested and crucified made their attendance remarkably noticeable. But evidently, they were ready to die 
for being associated with Jesus. They were not arrested. And Mark said that Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of, of Jesus, had followed Joseph, who had taken possession of Jesus' corpse. And they followed to see where Jesus had been buried. Of course, Friday at 6 p.m., all labor for Jewish folks had ceased because Sabbath had started. Saturday evening at 6 p.m., Sabbath was over, but the night, the dark, was no time to be attending to the deceased body of a loved one. But when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, purchased spices so they might go and anoint Jesus. Then, Mark tells us, very early, most likely at first light, the next day, the first day of the week, Sunday morning, these same women went to the tomb. When they arrived at the burial place, they were surpri surprised to find the cover stone rolled to the side. Now, Mark, who is a master storyteller, depicts the women as casually entering the tomb. But as they enter the tomb, they encounter not the corpse they expect, but a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. Then Mark simply observes, almost as an afterthought, that they were alarmed. <laughs> they were alarmed? Yes! Uh, remember, it's very early. Light is just pushing out the darkness when the women go to the tomb. Keep in mind that the tomb is probably a cave, but regardless of its construct, it has no windows. It's dark in there. The women go in expecting to find a dead body, but see a young man dressed in a white robe instead. And Mark says, no doubt with a smile on his face as he writes, they were alarmed. Uh, yeah, they were alarmed, probably alarmed half out of their wits. Uh, the young man dressed in a white robe says, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. But the most alarming thing to happen that morning is what comes next. The young man, dressed in the white robe, continues his explanation to the women by saying, Jesus has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place where they laid him. First century followers of nonviolent religious rebellions in the Roman Empire, of which Jerusalem was part, saw their leaders violently and cruelly executed by Roman crucifixion. These followers were permitted to live so that they would vocally discourage others from trying to rebel against such formidable foes. The followers of nonviolent movements of insurrection were left to live in their fear. This technique usually worked quite well, usually. But on this first Easter morning, nothing was usual. In fact, nothing would ever be the same again. Mark ends this story by telling us that the women fled from the tomb. They were in fact seized, says Mark, by both terror and amazement. So much so 
that they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Of course, Mark figures his audience is sharp enough to realize that they got over their fear. After all, Mark knows the story. The word got around. Jesus is not in the tomb. You know, all through Mark's gospel, a master storyteller, all through Mark's gospel, one of the obvious things that you notice is that Jesus has not been where you expect him to be. And now we expect him to be in the tomb. But not this Jesus. And like the women, perhaps we too should be filled with terror and amazement. If God, in fact, was willing to tear through the very fabric of separation between God and humanity through this man Jesus, then Surely, there are implications for us. If Jesus lived a life worthy of following, worthy of emulating, and if God raised Jesus from the dead, then surely there are implications for us. And Jesus did live a life worthy of emulating. And God has raised Jesus from the dead. And there are implications for us. Today, we celebrate a risen Lord, and rightly so. Today, we sing, Christ the Lord is risen today. And rightly so. But let me ask you this. What difference will it make? What impact will resurrection have on your life? Who will you love with the love of Christ because God has raised him from the dead? Who will you reach out to that Jesus would reach out to? Who will you show kindness to that Jesus would show kindness to? Christ the Lord is risen today. Earth and heaven in chorus say, Alleluia. Raise your joys and triumphs high. Alleluia. Sing, ye heavens. And earth reply, Alleluia. But what difference will it make? Who will you be tomorrow because God has raised Jesus from the dead? The women fled the tomb in terror and amazement, and they said nothing to anyone. And now it's your turn. Now it's up to you. Now you've heard the story. Who will you tell? Who will you love? How will your life be different because of this Lenten journey you've been through that ends in Easter? Who will you be because God did raise Jesus from the dead. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love re 
remain steadfast. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. You sent him to Israel, preaching good news of peace, the word which was proclaimed throughout all of Judea. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, he gave thanks to you. He broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then, when the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my body of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. On the third day, he raised him from the dead. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will come, come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. For you have put all things under his feet and have made him head over all things for his church. By your spirit, make us one with Christ and one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at the heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, with confidence of the children of God, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Let us truly be your resurrection people. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Can you imagine walking into a dark cave when the shadowy cover of night is just beginning to be invaded by light, expecting to find a dead body and encountering a young man who abruptly says, do not be alarmed. You know, Mark is my favorite gospel author. The, the whole story, as Mark tells it, is filled with mystery and intrigue. And he ends his story telling us that the first witnesses to the resurrection were so frightened that they ran away in terror and amazement and they said nothing to anyone. Obviously, we know they told someone because now even we know the story. So what is Mark up to? Mark is a master storyteller. And now he has placed the story that changes everything into your hands. What will you do in response to God's remarkable alteration of our very existence? Death is not the end. Death does not have the final say. 
What will your response be to the story of God's love for all creation? How will you be changed? Who will you love?